It gives me a great pleasure as, to introduce a very old friend of mine, William Strickland, who spent his early years of political activism working as executive director of the Northern Student Movement, which wanted to be the Northern analog of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, working for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and working on the Harlem rent strikes in the 1960s. That's where we met, actually. During this time, Strickland also worked with Malcolm X, whom he knew from his childhood days. A, a graduate of Boston Latin School, Harvard College, Harvard University, he currently is director of the Du Bois Papers collection at the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of African Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he also teaches political science. I give you William Bill Strickland. by thanking the, uh, the left forum for, for inviting me to participate um, because it has given me the opportunity to, to uh, reflect on my, on my past and also to see people like, like Stanley when I was young and very innocent. The, uh, there were, this was back in the day. There's a, there's a documentary about the, about the Southern struggle called It Was a Mighty, Mighty Time. And back then it was a, it was a mighty, mighty time. Because it was, <laughs> it was Malcolm, Miss Baker was here, Malcolm X was here, Jesse Gray was here, the, um, Byron Rustin was here doing doing school doing school boycotts. It was as we used to say in the corner, Chico, the joint. Gene, is that you? <laughs> and so I was able to work with. As Stanley was one of the people who was helping us young people at the time, and Danny Schechter, who's sitting over here, we worked together back back in the day. I can't see everybody. Any old SNCC people here? All right. I wanted to, however, take uh, exception to a couple of things that Stanley said. I, I do think the time is unprecedented. And I want to explain why I think it's unprecedented. At, at one level of historical logic, we can say that feudalism was logical, you see, and slavery was logical. But now we, have, we are dealing with a ruling class, this 1%, that is irrational, that is idiotic, um, that has let loose forces that it cannot control itself. When Nemo, Nemo was, was speaking earlier, if Celsius goes up three degrees, it's the end of Africa. Maldives will go underwater, and you may not know it, but you are on the same latitude and longitude as Maldives. If Maldives goes, New York City goes. But they don't care. They do not care. We need to understand what the challenge is. The challenge is that America is an empire. The problem is it can no longer be an empire and serve the needs of the nation. Therefore, all 50 states are bankrupt. And why are they bankrupt? Because corporations do not pay taxes. They pay 6.6% of the taxes. America is now the greatest debtor nation in the history of the world. Understand that. When Bush left, we were $10 trillion in debt. We are now $16 trillion in debt. And Obama tells us he has created 2.8 million jobs, but we have exported 8 million jobs. And why should we not? when we subsidize the export of jobs. When is the last time you picked up your telephone 
and called anywhere to your doctor's office, to the motion picture theater, to the dentist's office, to the supermarket, and spoke to a human being. Cuando <laughs> fue? Huh? So I'm arguing, and it's also true, Stanley, America does not have 200 bases worldwide. It has 900 bases worldwide. It has 450 bases in Afghanistan alone. And it built in Iraq the greatest embassy in the history of the United States military. It, is, it cost $1 billion. And if you wish to have any idea of how Walt Disney-like your government is, you should read a very wonderful book by a Washington Post reporter. I'm going to, I'm going to screw up his name. Rajiv Chandraskakasan, something like that. But the book is called Imperial Life <coughs> in the Emerald City. Imperial Life in the Emerald City. If you read that book, it will show you just how Walt Disney-like American, the American uh, occupation of Iraq was under Bush Cheney. And how many Iraqis have we killed? Hundreds of thousands. So let me ask you another question. How many of you watched the Arab Spring on television? Tunisia, Egypt, how many? The rest of you guys weren't watching the tube? <laughs> All right. Now every day we are confronted with what is happening in Syria. Well, let us stop and think. That means the American media <clears throat> has the capacity to give you on-site coverage from the Middle East. Now let me ask you another question. When is the last time you saw on-site coverage from Kabul and Baghdad? When? All you've heard is the military giving you the same wonderfully accurate explanations that they gave you in relation to Jessica Lynch. <laughs> Pat Tillman and Vietnam, the same military. And I speak from personal experience because I was in the Marine Corps. The, uh, so we need to understand the times are fundamentally different. And we have a problem um, about being successful to change this country. Once upon a time, Malcolm X said, a third of Americans want to do the right thing. Another third don't know what the right thing is, and the last third is hopeless. Well, that last third has got greater, greater, and greater. If you go back and look at the Republican Party, there's a difference, as crooked as he was, between Richard Nixon and George Bush and Ronald Reagan and Michelle Bachman, Sarah Palin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They have reached out and brought into their party these euphemistically, let us call them knuckleheads. <clears throat> but if we are going to try and affect change in the country, we have to understand the problems that we face. There was a man many years ago whose name was Vladimir Ulyanov. He was born in 1870. And when he began to struggle for change in his country, <clears throat> he said something that we need to take to heart. Let's put our he said, look like the enemy, talk like the enemy. You can even act like the enemy, but think for yourself. We have to appreciate what America is. If we're going to make change and try and reach that two, those two thirds, you must think about what happens when we identify ourselves as leftists. What happens? 
we are automatically dismissed. You must think about how they have socialized this population for the last six decades. And what have they done? How, have they, how has the right come to power? It's another taboo question. It's called racism. You see? In 1955, the Republican Party adopted the Southern, the Southern strategy. And what was the Southern strategy? What you were not taught in your, in your high schools is that the South ruled the country. You go back and look at your, at your constitution. They were able to rule the, the country because of the concessions they forced upon the North. There would not have been the United States of America if the North had not conceded. So you have only two senators for every state, regardless of the population of those states. You have an electoral college, to which I will come back. And they also had something called the federal ratio, where they got three-fifths of a vote for every black person whom they owned. It was those extra eight electoral votes that made Thomas Jefferson the third president of the United States. And it was those, that extra black presence that enabled the South to rule this country in the antebellum period. And when they could no longer rule it, they split. Next year will be the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation was, quote, an act of military necessity because the North was losing the war. When the war was over, with the assistance of 200,000 black people in the Army and 20,000 <laughs> in the Navy and taking away the, the, the force, the institution of slavery from the South, Abraham Lincoln said, take from the field the black troops we now have, we would lose the war in three weeks. They never told you that because it defies sanity to think about the contribution black people have made and then how we were betrayed. So they had to pass the 13th Amendment because slavery was legal. That's why they had to pass the 13th Amendment. And then the South started killing people and passing the black codes. So the Republican Party was faced with the, with the dire prospect of winning the war and losing control of the government again. And therefore, they had to pass the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. I'm researching this period now between 1865 and 1900 because I'm concerned about another significant element left out of American history. And that is a word that is not acceptable in academia. The word is murder. If you look at the man who put forward the first anti-lynching law in this country, he was, a, he was a, a congressman from North Carolina named George Henry White. So I'm researching George Henry White, looking at his speech before Congress. And he says, <clears throat> between 1865 and 1900, 53,000 of my people were murdered. That averages out to about 1,350 a year but it's not in the books. We are now trying to validate the accuracy of, uh, of, of White's accusation. Anyway, the blacks are betrayed, <clears throat> and the South takes that political power of having, exploiting the black political body, and then they rule this country. They created little wonderful things, the, the filibuster. They created the two-thirds rule, which you're still dealing with, but think about the relevance of, uh, and the Democratic Party, the, which overthrew, was the party of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1924, the Democratic Party had the, last, the longest political convention in the history of American politics. It went 113, 16 days, 113 ballots, putting forward their own candidate for president. And if you go back and, and look at that time, they marched down Pennsylvania Avenue, 40,000 strong. But that's suppressed in your history, too. I mention all this to bring us to the present because with that power, they prevented an anti-lynching bill. They prevented uh, the, code, the protocol against, against genocide because they were the senior people in the House and in, and in the Senate. And that's what the Republicans went to. They wanted to take the South away from the Democratic Party 
and that's what they have done. Now, I want you to calculate what I'm about to explain to you. There are 150 states and two senators, i.e. 100. There are 435 congresspersons. It's a total of 535 votes. In order to become president of the United States, you need 271 electoral votes. The 11 states of the Confederacy equal 60% of all that's necessary to become president of the United States. If you win the correct number of 16 states, you or your dog can become president. Right? That's what the Republicans have done. In, in 1972, Bush was the first Republican to win all states of the Confederacy. And then along came Ronald Reagan. He kicked off his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi in 1980, where Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodwin were killed. He was endorsed by the Klan, and then, of course, he rejected the endorsement. But that's the racial politics the Republicans have used. Willie Horton with Bushy, and then Bushy Jr. stole the 2000 in 2004 elections, and we get back to the eunuchs in the Democratic Party. <laughs> because instead of saying uh, the Supreme Court stopped the voting recount in Florida, <laughs> to talk about Jeb Bush and Katherine Harris, head of the Bush's campaign and Secretary of State, <laughs> and they blamed it all on Ralph Nader. <laughs> they moved back six years. The Republicans impeached Clinton for lying about an affair, sexual affair, but the Democrats would not impeach Bush for lying about a war. So if you go, they've probably taken it down. But if you go to John Conyers' website when he was um, chair of the House subcommittee, <clears throat> his staff prepared a report on, on Iraq called Constitution in Crisis. It will blow your mind. If you're old enough to remember, haven't repressed the memory, you remember when General Powell came to the United Nations with all, with all of his charts and his graphs to explain why we were going to initiate shock and awe. And you ever think about that phrase, shock and awe? <clears throat> Once upon a time when I was in high school, we had to choose between, it, between German and Greek, and I walked into the Greek and, and saw all these little funny hieroglyphs, so I, talk, I, I said, what was here, Van Steenberg, and I took German. When I heard shock and awe, the first thing that came to my mind was Blitzkrieg. Bestechte Blitzkrieg. All right. So here we are now, the Republicans, our challenge. They control the Supreme Court. They control 11 of the 13 appeals courts. Five corporations control the media and they're privatizing everything. They're privatizing prisons, privatizing education, they want to privatize Medicare and Social Security, and they privatize the military. You also don't know, Bush privatized 25% of the IRS. They were not given the, ch the charge to um, investigate corporations. I had a graduate student made $23,000, they investigated her. There were 113,000 private military contractors in Iraq, as opposed to, to 90,000 U.S. troops. More private military contractors died last year than American military troops. There are are 18 attempted suicides by veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan every day. 18 a day attempted suicides. There is no question being asked, why, where does this PTSD come from? 
It's never existed before in any of America's wars. What is driving the vets crazy? So they kill themselves and or they kill other people. What? But there is no discussion in this country about real discussion about PTSD or what in fact is going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. So what must we do? One of the challenges, perhaps the most important, is longevity. What distinguishes the right from us? I was a patron for Planned Parenthood, there's a, and there's a group up in Amherst, in Northampton actually, called Tapestry Health, where they were celebrating the 39th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Now think about the difference between us and the right. 39th anniversary, the right has been fighting against Roe v. Wade for four decades. We need that kind of longevity. We also need an analysis because we don't have an analysis of this system. One of the things I learned working with Jesse Gray, this system is unfair everywhere. Understand? So we have, <laughs> so we have a, zillion, a zillion groups dealing with a, a particular contradiction, education, housing, racial profiling, police brutality, you name it, tax, citizens for tax justice, because of the uniformity of unfairness, of injustice, we have a zillion groups working at it. We do not have an analysis of how this system works and what it's being, we can't say capitalism. How does it work and where are its weak points? If we gave people a real analysis of the problem, it would overwhelm them. So we must have a manageable analysis. <laughs> and we need, uh, it needs to be manageable time-wise too. I think people can take f a five-year plan. They can take, so what do we need? We need a national recall movement. A national recall movement. But what is our problem? Our problem is this portion of America that buys Bill O'Reilly's books, that watches Glenn Beck on television, that listens to Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh got a contract from Clear Channel in 2010 for $400 million. $50 million for eight years. These people, as has been mentioned, cannot stand being looked at. They cannot stand being exposed. We, must, we need a manifesto that exposes them. We must expose corporate crime. Because what does corporate crime do? It kills us. 80% of cancer is sociogenic. That's why we have to see her nurses. The air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the chemically engineered food is killing us. But beyond that, think about Bhopal. Think about the Massey Mining Company, 29 deaths in 2010. They didn't, they didn't take Blankenship, the head. They just gave one of this lower, lower level flunky th three years. So you killed 29 people, you get three years in jail. Something is wrong with the system. Something is wrong with it. So we need to think about an analysis that is manageable and edible, but that has sufficient planks to make fundamental change. We need a single payer plank, yes. We need to define corporate crime, yes. We need to bring back Glass-Steagall, yes. And that's another question. It was Clinton's people. It was Summers and Rubin that killed Glass-Steagall. It was Clinton. So, yeah. It was Clinton that did, that did NAFTA. And the horrible concept is, there's a rumor that he may even appoint Larry Summers to be head of the World Bank. The world is looking at us. When Bush was president, there was no place in the world he could go where there were no, 
where there were not protests against him. That was not in the American media. He was the most despised political leader in the history of the world. Then all this hope burgeoned out with Obama. We need to take that hope, not depending on Obama, but we need to take that hope and to fashion it into a movement because the America is the evil empire. We are located in the heart of the evil empire. And what we do, if we can do it, will affect the world. Aloha.